So today, we're going to jump right into it. We are looking at James chapter 2. We're going to read through the text, sort of verse by verse, section by section, and unpack it together. We're talking about favoritism, or showing partiality. James 2, verse 1. It says, My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? And we'll stop there for a moment. Sometimes when we read the first verse of the section, we see it as an introduction. And so this will count as our introduction. And oftentimes we skip over the verse as, oh, this is sort of the heading to what we're about to talk about. But I think there's something important in this verse that we would be amiss to miss. It says, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? Showing favoritism calls into question whether we have Jesus as our Lord or not. That's a big statement. Oftentimes we think of favorites, and we might think of favoritism, and we think, why is this such a big deal? Everyone has their favorite ice cream, everyone has their favorite car, everyone has their favorite sports team, whatever it might be. So why can't I also have a favorite person? What is wrong with that? After all, I get along with someone this person more than I get along with this person. It's easier to relate with this person more than this person, so why is this such a big deal? We say things like, favoritism is not hating the other person, it's just liking one thing more than another. And you might question, doesn't God show favoritism? He talks about Israel being his chosen people. And God shows favor to us, because he likes it when we don't sin or when we do good deeds, doesn't he? Wouldn't that be a form of favoritism? These might be things that you've thought about. They might be things that you've heard other people say when talking about favoritism or partiality. These are things that go through our minds. But there's some common misconceptions in some of these. See, favoritism is liking something simply because we like it. It's liking something for our own sake. So wanting people not to sin or to do good is not for our sake, it's for their sake. To help them be better people. It be, excuse me, it's because we love them, we want them to be better. Not because they are a certain way that now we love them more. So what does this have to do with calling Jesus Lord? To call someone Lord is to say that they are a ruler over us, or they have some kind of uh, jurisdiction over something we're going to be dealing with. We are their servant. We want to do what they say. We want to walk in their ways. And favoritism is against the ways of God. His grace is for everyone. So if we are doing something or thinking something in a certain way of favoritism or of partiality, we are acting opposite to the desires of God. A few points about favoritism here as we go on in the verses. First, often favoritism is based on outward appearance. It's very uh, easy when you look at a car. I favor this car over this car because of the outward appearance. The first thing you notice about the car. Maybe people, some people really like red cars. And so I favor this car over this car, even though they're both the same vehicle, because this one is red. And this also do, does, has to do with people as well. If we go on in the verse, we see in verse 2, it says, If a per person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, 
If you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while the other one who is poor, you say, stay there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? See, so often we only notice what we see about someone or about something. We often see things that are the same as us or better than us. They're just easier for us to notice. So we see someone who we wish we could be, this rich man with the gold ring, with the fine clothes. We say, that's the person I want to get to know. That's the person I want to hang out with because they're doing something right and I want to know what their secret is. I want to know how to be more like them. They say there's beauty in symmetry or beauty in sameness. So if you look at a person's face, generally speaking, it's mostly symmetrical. And we call people deformed or we say they're ugly or whatever if their face is very radically not symmetrical. We like something to be the same. We like something to have some kind of similarity, some kind of commonality. And, we, and so when we look at it, we say that there's something about that that I like. It doesn't only have to do with faces. I think it has to do with the way people act and the way people walk, the way people talk. There's something about that person that I, I can relate with because I'm similar to them in some way. So we like to see ourselves in other people. But interestingly enough, if a face is too symmetrical, it's not as beautiful as a face that is slightly not symmetrical. Once it's too perfect, we notice the differences and we say that person is more beautiful than that person. I don't remember what test it was, but years ago I looked at this thing and they did a test about faces and how we see faces and how we perceive them and and what we call beautiful. It says there is a point where too perfect becomes too perfect. And then we notice the things that are different than maybe our face or different than the face that we just saw and we say that's the thing that distinguishes it, that's the thing that makes it beautiful, whether it be a pimple here or a freckle over here that isn't over here or whatever it might be. This is very evident when you grow up in Africa and you're a white person in a black person's world, right? For the women, it's especially evident because they get um, wedding propositions or marriage propositions all the time from the, the black men, especially if you're a young teenage woman because they are of mar marriageable age. And so my sister and people of her age all the time would get the wedding propositions from men in the market. Say, oh, how much for your daughter? What's the, how many cows? Whatever it might be, right? And they, and they try to do this because it's a perfectly normal and natural thing in their culture to marry someone when they're of marriageable age. And everyone else they see is, I mean, they have differences, but they're sort of all the same. But then someone stands out, this white girl. Oh, something different about her. Something special about her. And so it's very interesting that we both find something beautiful in what is the same and also what is entirely different than ourselves. See, beauty oftentimes is based on what we have or what we wish we had. But it's all based on this outward appearance idea. What I have maybe is a, a black wife as a black man. What I wish I had is also a white wife. So I see this woman, I want this other woman because it's something that I don't have that I wish I had. I wanted the wife I have now because it's something that is similar to me that I can relate with. And there's different personalities or different things about this, but what it all comes down to is we look at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. He looks for someone who is open and ready to change themselves and to change the world around them and is far less concerned about the things that we notice and the ways in which we categorize people. The second point about favoritism is that favoritism oftentimes is based on what we can get from someone. Notice in this verse, it talks about how they take notice of the person's clothing. They take notice of the fine jewelry and the fine clothing, and they want to go say, come, sit with me. 
and the person doesn't have fine jewelry and fine clothing, they ignore or they say, go away or sit at my feet or sit somewhere else because I'm less concerned about you because I don't feel like I can get anything out of you. I don't feel like it's profitable to get to know you very well for my own sake. I heard a story just this week actually of a man who says he, at one time in his life he was very poor. He was living homeless. He didn't have anywhere to stay. He could hardly get any food together. But he says he dressed well because he still had his clothes. His clothes didn't go bad. They didn't run away. He still owned his clothes. So he put on a suit and he went to church every Sunday. And people would always come up to him and they'd say hi and they'd greet him and everything else. And he went for a few weeks. And one week, someone through conversation found out that he was homeless. And the next week, his group of 10 friends became two. And he wondered what happened. The next week, it was the same two. The next week, it was one. And he quickly realized they were judging him based on his outward appearance. This is a man walking into a church with a fine suit. He must have a lot of money. I must be able to get something out of this guy. And once they found out he had nothing at all, they left. The sorry state of the world and not only the world as we talk about it, but the church itself. The people within our own sort of space and, and ways of relating can treat each other that way. That we can treat each other that way. So often, this is the case when we let a rich person become our Lord instead of Jesus. Instead of going to Jesus and saying, Jesus can give me all these things I need. Jesus can give me all these things that, I, that, that can lead me into my life. And I just want to do what he says and follow in his ways and sit at his feet. We see someone and we say, what can I get out of this person? How can this person fulfill my needs? How can this person do for me what I wish I could do for myself? And now I don't need God anymore. So we show favoritism to them. We might not be doing this consciously, saying I'm going to go to this person instead of to God. But in our hearts, that's what we're doing. We are instead calling them Lord instead of Jesus. So we serve them hand and foot, hoping they'll give us our sec their secret to success or their generous donation. But who are we to serve? Who is our Lord? And so we see here in a very clear way that favoritism calls into question whether Jesus is truly our Lord or not. Now because God looks at the heart, he sees what we do not see. He notices things like the widow's might. You remember that story where the widow comes in and she gets just her little bits and no one notices, and those who do notice complain about what she's giving, and Jesus notices and praises her for it. Sometimes poverty strengthens our allegiance to or our faith in God. If we are poor in the world, where else can we turn to provide for our needs of God? We must, have, must have faith that God can and will give us what we need in his time and in his ways, because we couldn't possibly do it on our own. But if we could possibly do it on our own, then there is a chance that we actually won't pay attention to God. And I'm not saying this is a black and white thing. If you are poor, your faith is great. And if you are rich, your faith is no good. But there are tendencies in each of these spaces. Let's go on to verse 5. It says, Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. That's what we've been talking about. Rich in their faith and then it says heirs of the kingdom. The poor are the ones set to inherit God's kingdom. Why is this the case? Because they are serving the Lord of the kingdom instead of serving themselves. Their poverty pushes them toward faith in God and leads them to serving Him. Kingdom becomes the kingdom comes to others through their generous service as God directs them. So verse six says, But you have dishonored the poor. 
It is not the rich, is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? See, if you wrong a person, there's consequences. But depending on how much money the person has, the consequences will differ, especially in the society we live in. If you wrong a poor person, they might not have anything they can do about it. They might not have enough money for a good lawyer, or to pay for the fees for court, or whatever this might be. And so they're stuck. They go, well, it is what it is. Got to keep going. Got to move on. Got to press on. But if you wrong a rich person, they can do something about it. They could, if they want, sue you for everything they have. They could hire the best lawyer, and they could win. And oftentimes, if people with a lot of money who have this sort of mentality about them will sue people for the potential that they might possibly win. Whether they're innocent or guilty, it's irrelevant because it's all about what we can get from this person, right? So it says, is it not the rich who oppress you? The people who have all the money, the people who have it all, they think they have it all together. Don't they have far more means in and of themselves than anyone else? So why are we favor favoring them? The laws of this world revolve around riches, revolve around perception, revolve around outward appearances. It's all about what, I, what, what you did and what I saw you do. When the cop pulls you over, he says, you were going 150 kilometers in 100, so I'm going to impound your car. It's not because you had a, a dirty thought that he impounds your car. It's not because whatever, something's wrong in your heart that he, he sent you to jail. It's because he saw you do something. He says, now this is the consequences. It's all about the outward appearance. The laws don't care too much about how messed up you are inside as long as you keep it inside. As long as you don't let it out, then you're okay. But God's law is far more interested in our thoughts and in our hearts. And yes, it touches on how those things manifest. It touches on our behaviors. But there's something behind those behaviors that God is also interested in helping us deal with. It talks about this in verse 8 where it goes into the law and we see how this relates to our, how we perceive people and favoritism. It says, you do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures. The law is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. But whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who says you shall not commit adultery also says you shall not murder. And now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. This is called a royal law, the way these verses start, because it's the law of your Lord and your King. He says to love without partiality. He says partiality is sin. See, we can easily excuse sins of the heart and sins of the mind as something that is not as important, something that maybe we don't have to deal with, something that nobody knows about, so why would I bother doing anything about it? Something maybe it's just it's just the way I am and I can't do anything about it. And so who are you to judge me for who I am? We like to talk about the laws like adultery and thievery and murder, those outward appearance sort of things. Those are the things that if I stay away from those, then I'm okay. But as we know, when Jesus came, he furthered these things. He said, if, if you have hated someone, you've murdered them in your heart. If you've lusted after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. This is what Jesus is getting at. That is far more about what's in your heart than what we see on the outside. Because if we can deal with those things that are inside, we can deal with those heart issues, those heart patterns, the behaviors will go with them. And so if we hate some other person or act negatively against them because we're favoring someone else, first we need to deal with that issue.
that maybe I do have an issue with favoritism. Maybe I do have an issue with liking this person over this person or this group over that group, and maybe I need to wrestle with that and deal with that. And that will make our relationships more healthy. See, oftentimes we look at these verses, we look at verse 10 in particular. This has been read sort of out of context a lot. It says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. I'm sure you've heard this verse before, read as a single line in some spot to prove a point or to say something. And oftentimes it's read to say, that means that no matter what you do, you're a sinner and so you need Jesus to save you. Because if you've done one little thing, basically you've done all of them. But if we read it in context, it's less about condemning ourselves and more about loving others. Because all of these things are equally unloving to other people, whether we murder them, whether we commit adultery, whether we steal from them, whether we show favoritism to someone else who is not them. All of these things are just as unloving to someone. Some examples from the Bible about favoritism, and we see how the thought patterns or the heart patterns of these people led them to behaviors that were more, quote-unquote, overt sins or the things that we see. We know Jacob and Esau. Remember these characters. One was a character and one was a different sort of character. And they had this issue of favoritism, and it led to one brother hating another brother, and Jacob ended up running away from Esau, and he didn't ever see his brother, and then he came back, and he said, I want to be your servant because of this whole mess that had happened. And we know later on we have Leah and Rachel, who were Jacob's two wives, and they hated each other. And why did the hatred come up? It was because Jacob favored Rachel. That was the reason. And then there was hatred, and then they started arguing over who was allowed to sleep with their husband one-on-one -on -one what night, and they started giving away their their uh, servants to be um, concubines for him so they could have children through them because they wanted more children than the other wife so they could be more favored all of a sudden. And they hated each other, and they were essentially living in a broken home, raising their kids in a broken home, two families under the same roof, but not really joined together. And the next generation, we see Joseph, who because Jacob showed favoritism to Rachel, he also showed favoritism to Joseph. And as we know, the story of Joseph, his brothers attempted to murder him. And they lied about it and sent him to exile. And this whole thing happened and their father was distraught. All of this generation after generation after generation, simply because someone showed favoritism to someone else. This isn't something simple or something small or something that we can say, well, that's just, maybe I should work on that sometimes, but it, it doesn't matter as much as the big things. But as we see, as the ball gets rolling and as these things happen, we can see that the thought patterns and the heart patterns we have that are not right, that are negative, lead to negative behaviors. The sin of favoritism accompanies a host of others. Because lack of love is the heart problem that causes each and every one of them. The same root cause has many manifestations. Continue on in the verse here in verse 12. This is the conclusion of after do not show favoritism. It says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. When I read this section, four words jump off the page at me. Verse 14, it says, Can faith save you? 
And the initial thought that we have is, of course, my faith saves me. Faith in God saves me. What in the world is this talking about? Of course, faith saves me. I prayed that magic prayer, and I have faith that God can forgive my sins. It is my faith that saves me. But in fact, it does not. Our faith doesn't save us. Our faith has never saved us. Instead, it is God's grace that saves us. Grace through faith. Faith is the means that we get to the grace. But it is the grace itself that saves us. Grace is the action that we have faith in. The action of God. So faith without grace is dead. Faith without the works of God that he did for us is faith in what? Faith in nothing. Faith in an unfaithful God, maybe, who, who won't do the things he said he was going to do. Our faith in his action of grace leads to our action. Faith in him leads to us serving him through our actions. See, so often we uh, hear about uh, thoughts and prayers. Have you ever heard of that? Someone says, my thoughts and my prayers are with you. Or maybe you've said that to someone, my thoughts and my prayers are with you. And it's interesting that this, though it is a positive statement, can also be done in a favoritism sort of way without thinking about it. To some people, we say we give our money, we give our time, we give whatever it might be, and to other people, in passing, we say, oh, I'm sorry to hear about that, my thoughts and my prayers are with you, and we keep going. And so why is it the case that for some people we say thoughts and prayers and for other people we get our hands dirty? Is this not also a form of favoritism? But instead, as we bring our thoughts and our prayers to God and we say, God, this, per this situation, this person that I have uh, encountered, they have this situation and we're praying about it and God reveals to us what we are to do about it. As we bring these situations to our Lord, he says, now this is what you should do. Now this is where you should go. Now this is how you should act. So to turn our corner to a close here, we are called to live in a pattern that is similar to the pattern of Jesus. Or as the way it's normally said, to walk in his ways, to walk in his footsteps. What would Jesus do? So God gave of himself for us when we were unfavorable. So would it be not too much for him to ask us to give of ourselves for the sake of someone else, even when that person is unfavorable? And this will manifest in different ways. And this will look different depending on who you are, depending on who you're talking to. But I'd encourage us that when we have those moments of, of those thoughts and prayers moments, right? Where, when we're praying for someone to take time to listen. Take time to say, God, this is a situation that this person is dealing with. This is the situation that I've heard about over here. What do you want me to do about it? And then listen. Instead of saying, God, help this person with this situation. What's the next thing I need to cross off on my list? But taking time to listen to what our Lord says to us. And he might reveal to us ways in which we have um, shown favoritism in the past that we maybe shouldn't have. He may reveal many things to us as we listen to the way he talks and to what he says. So I hope that can encourage us in our own prayer life as we go into these spaces and as we in, in, encounter these situations when we feel the um, temptation to show favoritism, we can be aware of that and say, God has revealed to me that I have a tendency to show favoritism to so, such and such a person or to such and such a group of people, and we need to keep that in check and remind ourselves of that.